I wouldn't do it live in. yet. I would wait until um, I. It is an absolute honor to be able to hold this again. Did you actually go live already? We've done this uh, this go to, year. Go to we've taken it up a whole other notch. Yeah, we've got so more go to... sponsors. We've got raffle prizes. We've got more people attending. We've got Mike Kottmeyer here talking to us about why Agile fails. Really cool stuff. So I need you to just go through. Okay, My name is Brian Schoberg. I run the DC Scrum User Group along with a slew of help okay. uh, around here. <laughs> Where's all our, I got yep, Tracy okay. back there, uh, yeah, Nora, there. Julie, Mark Hepler, uh, Sean Killeen, uh, Matias back there. Raise your hands. Let's hear it for all of them, Mark Grove, uh, for helping out with this thing. Done like a well-oiled machine. Um, we've got the live stream up now, so it's, uh, keep it PG to G uh, if we can. <laughs> The, uh, so if you are on Twitter, we'd love to see you uh, tweet some stuff, maybe some pictures that you snapped tonight. Uh, Agile giving, hashtag Agile giving is what uh, we've used in the past that, that works out. So use that and then at HomestretchVA is the Homestretch uh, Twitter handle and we've also got DC Sug uh, or Excelico as far as the place here you're at uh, Excelico. So I want to also thank all of the other meetups that are part of this mashup. You can read the list, but we've got Scaling Agile Nova, DevOps DC, DC Enterprise Agilist, uh, Agile and, uh, Leadership Network, a slew. I haven't done the, the count, yeah, but I think if you were to run the numbers, months. we'd probably be in excess of almost 10,000 people that is part of this network. Uh, that's really, really cool. Yeah. So thank you for all the meetups, uh, Business Agility. Thank you, Jim. Um, but, so we've got a bunch of sponsors. I'm not going to be able to go into details on each and uh, every sponsor, but I do want to take a moment because Excella is throwing um, not just the space here, but also doubling whatever funds we raise tonight, along with all the sponsor money that has gone in so far, we'll be matching that. So already we're looking at close to $5,000 coming in from Excella. So let's, let's hear it for Excella. <laughs> And Burton's going to tell you a little bit more about Excella, but I, I want to just make sure we do give uh, a lot of credit to the sponsors that have made this happen. We've got Agile Craft, Agilus, uh, who will also be giving away raffle prizes at the end of the night. So if you haven't gotten your raffle ticket, make sure you do. We've also got CA Technologies um, sponsoring, Cater to Me. Actually, Daniel, I didn't even uh, mention her. She's been helping people move up and down the elevators all night tonight because we had a snafu there. She went ahead and reached out to her uh, resources, Cater to Me. They supplied all the food free of charge. Uh, so let's hear it for Cater to Me. So we've got CGI Federal. Um, Nate, uh, Nathan Harvey, uh, last minute, sends me an email on Sunday night. He says, oh, can you include this real quick? Went ahead and donated. Awesome, thanks, Nate. Uh, could use a little more notice, but he wanted me to certainly uh, let you know that DevOps Days DC will be coming sometime in 2017, and also DevOps uh, DC, or DevOps Baltimore, DevOps Days Baltimore will be coming in 2017. So stay tuned for more information on that. We've also got Exivity, um, Eliason Group, and also Leading Agile, who not only is Mike phone down here to come talk to you guys about why Agile fails, his company went ahead and also sponsored uh, and gave uh, a nice donation, generous donation to Homestretch. Uh, so let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, tip our hats to, to Mike Sweet. and Agile. Uh, we've got Lightspeed, represented by Bob Payne and maybe a few others, I think. Um, they're going to also be giving away a nice raffled prize tonight, but uh, also a donator. Uh, Civitech also giving away raffle prizes, Spark Agility. Also, I encourage you guys to go out and find out what all of these companies provide as service offerings. Great companies. Uh, we work with many of them in, in the DC Beltway. Uh, Spark Plug Agility, providing training. Team Catapult, I don't know, I didn't see Marsha here. Uh, if you want to get your, learn all about how to do great at facilitating, uh, Marsha is definitely the, a, a person to, to talk to about that. And then version one, who is, um, Mike used to work for him. Used to work for him, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, but also another sponsor. So uh, I believe that rounds out all of our sponsors. So let's hear it one more time for all the sponsors. <laughs> and 
And now I want to turn it over to uh, Burton White, who is one of three co-founders of uh, Excella, and a, uh, a great leader uh, we all look up to, at least at Excella. And uh, he's going to introduce <laughs> himself and also uh, Homestretch. Well, it's nice to be uh, said that you I'm looked up to by a guy in a Santa hat. <laughs> He said I wouldn't get fired. Okay. I, I did. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Burton White. I'm the, one of the co-founders of Excel and also the managing partner. And I want to thank you all for being here. It's really, this is a terrific group. Um, I'm so thrilled. Brian started this event uh, with a lot of help, but Brian really was the, the mastermind behind it a year ago. I'm just thrilled to see it uh, continue to another year and also grow so much. This is really remarkable. So Brian, thank you for your leadership in making this happen. Really terrific. Um, so I, want to, I want to double down on Brian's thanks to all of the co-sponsors, our co-sponsors tonight. You all, you all have been so generous, and because of that, it's going to cost Excel a lot of money. <laughs> it's money that we're thrilled to, to put into the pot. Um, so I also want to thank. Um, Mike Kottmeyer, thank you for being here because I think you are a big part of the draw tonight. So, oh, uh, and to come here and speak about why Agile fails is terrific. Are you also going to help us understand how to prevent it? Yeah, the subtitle is and what you can do about it. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we we are all about impact, but we like it to be the you know that kind, and I'm not that kind. Yeah. Thank right. you. Um, so um, we are at Excel. We're very passionate about impacting our community. We look at it that community impact in a couple of ways. One is impacting our professional communities, and the other is helping those in our community who need our help. And uh, this event is just a perfect um, combination of the two. In, in, the, uh, in our professional communities, we, we really believe in uh, connecting with all of you, sharing what we know, uh, and learning from everybody so that together we all uplift uh, our professional communities. And um, so I want to pause and thank also the leaders of, of all these meetups that are here tonight because you're creating a platform that enables all of us to have a great impact on our community. So thank you for that. Much, much appreciate that. Um, the other thing we do to impact our communities uh, is through our partnership with Homestretch. Homestretch helps homeless families gain the knowledge, skills, and hope they need to become self-sufficient. And we chose to partner with Homestretch nine years ago because of the massive impact that they have on the families that they serve. And so tonight, you're all a part of that impact. And uh, you're going to really love learning a little bit more about what Homestretch does so that you, I hope, will connect what you've done tonight to the, uh, to the impact of families that you're going to be impacting by virtue of that. So, it's a great night uh, for Excel. We're proud to be a sponsor. It's a great night for all of our co-sponsors. Great night for the meetups and for Homestretch, and I hope for all of you. So thank you for being here uh, to be part of this. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, uh, invite Chris Fay to come up. Chris Fay is the uh, executive director of Homestretch. He is a, an extraordinary leader in our community and in the lives of so many uh, worthy families. So thank you, Chris, for being here to join us. I think, I think the deal is you need to stay in this box. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 We'll be online. Thank, Thank you, Burton. It's a real pleasure to address people that have not heard me before because I feel like I can share with you something really special and really quite remarkable that's happening right here in our own midst. I'd like all of you, just for a second, to imagine a homeless person. You all have a picture in your head of what a homeless person looks like? Is that person nine years old? The average age of a homeless person in the United States is only nine. The average age of a homeless person in home stretch is only eight. So first, think of a homeless child with their parent. We take homeless families, it means there's a parent with children. We put them in a home, and then we surround them with services designed to propel them out of poverty. And this is important. Most programs working with the homeless 
have a very simple goal, and that is to ensure that that homeless family has a roof over their head. It's a very good or very humane objective, but it's not ours. Ours is different. Our goal is to propel them out of poverty so that there is no risk of homelessness ever again. Imagine a, a trafficking victim from Kenya, 18 years old, promised an education in the United States by this American woman. Instead, she's put on a plane and taken to Mexico where she spends almost a year in a brothel, escapes, is raped twice and moved to the United States. She comes to our doors broken in spirit and in body, thinking, what have I done with my life? With a child in her womb that she didn't even want. Imagine that same woman two and a half years later, having earned the degree to become a registered nurse. Imagine another woman, domestic violence survivor, fled with nothing but her child and a bag of clothes. Two and a half years later, two and a half years later she's a pharmacist. Everyone who comes to us is homeless, but with our help, we provide an environment. You've heard the old adage, in every crisis there's an opportunity. That's what we try and do, to make sure that that crisis for that family actually opens up a phenomenal opportunity to completely alter the course of their life. And it happens. One of the reasons I love this job so much is that I get to see it happen. I get to witness it. We have a very, very intensive structure of services. We ask a lot of the families. When they come in, they don't just take what we give. They actually have to work very hard for a, a very, very specific set of goals, which includes increasing their income by two or three times in two and a half years. The average increase per family at Homestretch in, uh, in their time with us is 155%. That's not enough. You actually think, if you start at $7 an hour, that means you're making maybe 20. We want to get them up to 30 or more. But in two and a half years out of poverty, that actually is a statistic that leads the entire nation in terms of so, your dollars tonight are supporting those families who are engaged in the process of taking what was a terrible beginning and coming to an amazing ending for themselves. It's not really an ending, but the ending of their tenure in home stretch means they're going to move into housing they can afford and the income they earn. They have a career. Their children are doing well in school. Their health has been restored. Their legal problems have been resolved. And their future is bright. That's what you're paying for by coming to this event tonight, and I thank you. Um, I'm going to be sticking around if anybody wants my card. I'd love to share it with you, tell you more about us. But I also want to give a very special thanks to Excella. They've been with us for about seven years? Nine years. Nine years. When we were very sm much smaller, and we've gone through some extraordinary changes in, ter in terms of adding programs and shifting the course of what we're doing so we can demonstrate that we are the best program um, achieving the most outstanding results in the nation. Another statistic that I love to share, we do outcome studies to determine how well the families do once they've left our care. One by George Mason University and two by George Washington University. They looked at how the families do two to five years after leaving our doors. The result, 95% remain housed that is not the norm for the country, <coughs> but it is the norm for families coming through home stretch. So thank you for your support. Thank you, Excella. And um, I hope you hear a lot more about us. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Chris. Um, not sure how long uh, Chris has been in the lead there, but uh, phenomenal success, great person, leading a great charge to help uh, many, many homeless families. And just the success stories are just, I, I bring tears to my eyes when I'm like reading these just dire, dire situations and then getting them turned around in, in a half a fraction of their lifetime and into successful situations. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I do want to say one other thank you. I think it's been said, but for those that came out here tonight and donated money to give to this great cause, 
thank you very much uh, for coming out here, come to see Mike talk, but also give uh, to a great cause. So thank you very much. One more round of applause, please. <laughs> All right, so I uh, am honored to present um, what's becoming a, definitely a friend of mine, uh, Mr. Kottmeyer. He uh, is uh, the CEO, owner of Leading Agile, which started up a few years ago, uh, but is a very uh, spirited charge to help large organizations fix uh, their highly complex situations that they've got themselves tangled into to get them into real organizational agility. Um, so. Um, He's a keynote speaker at, at many conferences. Uh, please don't hold this against him, but he did go to University of Florida. No Seminoles. Uh, but uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Mike Kottmeyer. Okay, so you're gonna give me an HDMI cable here? You guys have audio back there? You guys good? Okay, awesome. Let's see, hopefully this will work. Good, look at that, all right, it's even flipping. Okay, excellent. Okay, so this is gonna be super hard for me guys because it's like I have to stand on this little blue box of tape and I am like definitely like a hand waver move around the room. So I'm probably gonna like focus on you guys more because you're closer and I'm just gonna like pretend you guys don't exist. No, I'm just kidding. I probably just won't be able to give you the love that I would normally like to be able to give you guys. So this is actually a talk that I launched for, I think it was Agile 2014 was the first time I presented this. And I did it as keynotes uh, for several different companies, did it as a keynote for a couple of different conferences that I attended. And, and basically what I'm trying to do with this talk is I'm trying to build an argument for how I think we're thinking about Agile transformation wrong in our industry. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is over the next hour, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that, I'm gonna build a case for why I want you guys to think about Agile transformation differently. So real quick, I mean, is there anybody going through an Agile transformation right now? Okay, anybody like, anybody not doing Agile at all, at all in the room? So you guys, like everybody else is like all Agile out, right? <laughs> Okay, so how well is your Agile going? Who thinks their Agile's going awesome? Okay, well, yeah, of course you guys do, right? But you know what I mean? So, okay. So who thinks it's kind of going meh? It's meh. Okay, awful. Okay, there's some hands that didn't go up, so some of you guys aren't talking to me, but that's okay, cool. So this talk isn't just why Agile fails, it's why Agile fails in large enterprises and what you can do about it. And so, uh, as uh, Brian mentioned, my name is Mike Kottmeyer. Um, I grew up in big, complicated, messy Agile. I got introduced into Agile when I was a PMP project manager doing large scale kind of enterprise scrum mixed with XP, mixed with RUP, mixed with PMI stuff, right? It was a really interesting hodgepodge that we were going through. And what we were doing during that time is financial services, if I didn't say that. What we were doing during that time is we were blending approaches together. Because for us, the idea of creating a small six to eight person scrum team that had like everything and everyone necessary to deliver an increment of product was absolutely impossible. Like we couldn't do it. So we were blending scrum, extreme programming, we were applying David Anderson's early work in Agile management before kind of pre-Kanban stuff to do program and portfolio management and, and just developed a really strong point of view about what this thing can look like at scale. And then Brian also mentioned I spent a couple years with version one. And what was really formative for me about that time is that in about a two year period, I got to experience lots of different companies going through different forms of Agile transformation. Some doing it really well, so I'm doing it really poorly. And then I became like really super focused on what does it take to do this right? And I got really focused on why we were struggling and what the barriers were going on in, in these organizations. So this is a story I'm gonna to try to tell you guys. So a brief historical perspective. I hate starting any talk with like the manifesto or anything like that, but it's like there's a little bit of this that I'm gonna use as a pivot into the next round of slides. And so, if you look at the history of software engineering, right, we've been trying to figure out how to build software for a long time, 
Okay. And so this, in, this, this slide isn't designed to be like a, an intro to the history of software development, but all this stuff was going on that culminated about 15 years ago in the manifesto. Okay, 17 people got together and they were doing these things that were kind of proto-agile and they got together in Snowbird, Utah and they said, what do these things have in common? Okay, and what they came up with was a set of values, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation. They came up with customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and they came up with responding to change over following a plan. What I think is fascinating, and this is going to be like the starting place for the argument that I'm going to build, is that if you think about what they were really doing during that time, is that they were getting small groups of people around a table, right, doing things like pair programming, having an on-site customer, demoing working tested software on irregular intervals, right, they're doing burn down charts or, you know, whatever, right, you know, uh, user story cards, things like that. Reasonable, super high level, but, right, you guys get the idea. But there was all this stuff going on that got codified into a set of values, okay? That's the point that I want to make right now, okay? Um, and a set of principles, right? So I'm not going to read these to you, but these are the 12 principles behind the manifesto. What I think's interesting about this is one of the things that I struggle with with our community sometimes is that we get really super focused on culture, right, how we think. We get really super focused on process, the things that we do. And the reason why I think is because when you deconstruct this six to eight people sitting in a room with an on-site customer able to produce something that they can actually get value from on regular increments and get feedback, it got turned into a set of values and principles. And those values and principles are hugely important, okay? But it doesn't tell the whole story, okay? And then Scrum came along and, and spun up the CSM stuff, and it started really codifying the practices that we do. Mike Cohn's Agile Estimating and Planning came out, really codified the practices of what we do. But what I'm gonna make the case for is that the six to eight people sitting in a room, working with an on-site customer, producing something of measurable value every couple of days or every iteration or sprint, has gotten lost, okay? It's, it's abstracted behind the manifesto and some of the practices of Scrum, okay? So I started with, one of the things that was really formative for me about working for version one is I got a lot of time to write and to think because I didn't come out of like a pure play agile environment. We were doing a lot of really goofy stuff early in those days trying to figure out how to make this stuff work. So I didn't really have industry language. So I started writing on leadingagile.com and I started writing on version one's blog and I started trying to untangle and unpack some of the things that I was seeing as I experienced our industry firsthand. And so there's lots of dimensions that I split this along, but one of the dimensions that I started talking about was the idea of when you encounter agile language or agile practitioners, you have to kind of understand where they're coming from. And the three different points of view that I see most often in our industry, so we just hit on, right? We either talk about agile as culture, we talk about agile as practices, or what I'm gonna talk about is agile as structure. Okay, the structures and organizations that lead to agility. The six to eight people sitting in a room, on-site customer, able to produce something of value every sprint. Okay, so that's where we're gonna to start to go. Here's the interesting thing about culture. I believe that culture is super, super, super important. And I think an agile transformation would be a lot easier to do if everybody in the world got it. Okay, but not everybody in the world gets it, fair? Okay, and so if we approach our transformation by trying to change people's like hearts and minds, if we try to focus on being agile rather than doing agile, right? Some of these things you hear us say, being focused on values and principles, the bet that you're placing, okay, is that all of the practices and structures are going to emerge from that, okay? And what I'm finding 
is that no matter how agile you want to be, or no matter how agile the people in the company want to be, if the underlying structures in the organization don't support agility, it gets really frustrating. How many, guys, how many times have you guys seen somebody come back from a CSM class super excited to do Scrum and just hit a wall when they get back to the office, right? Okay, it happens all the time, right? Because it's like, you know, you start getting, you know, small companies, right, 30, 40 people, right? It's easy to run everybody through and to get everybody all excited at one time. But if you're dealing with a 6,000 person government agency, right, there are structural barriers to doing Agile. Okay, next point. If you start with practices, right, focusing on the things that you do, the roles, artifacts, ceremonies, test-driven development, you know, pair programming, any of those kinds of practices, the bet that you're making is that going through the motions of doing the practices will change minds. But I would suggest again that if the underlying structures that are needed for Agile to really take off aren't present, what you end up with is, is what we call like cargo cult scrum. Anybody doing the motions of Agile without getting the benefits of Agile? Like there was a comment that was made, and again, I, I, I hate to it's probably hearsay at this point, but I read someplace that Ken Schwabert said one time that 70% of the, the folks doing Scrum aren't going to get the value from doing Scrum, right? Why? Because doing a daily stand-up meeting doesn't make you Agile, okay? Having degrees of freedom, being able to respond to change when you learn new things, being able to get feedback from your customers, that's what increases agility, right? So no manner of practices are going to help us be more agile if the underlying structures of the organization don't lend themselves to agility, okay? The third thing, when I think of agile structures, right? I'm watching my slides. I haven't delivered this talk probably in this form in a couple years. So, um, so I, the reason why I didn't do the ones that I'm doing now is because I just had come up here for the agile DC thing, and uh, there was some fear that if I did the same deck, you guys wouldn't come today. So, so uh, we're, uh, we're, I'm, I'm having to cheat on my slides a little bit. So, if you're structure driven, you're focused on forming teams, building backlogs, producing working tests of software, installing agile structure, governance metrics, things like that. Because what we want to do is we want to give a home base for the practices that we learn and the cultural attributes that we want to, um, to, to take hold, okay? So my general bent on agile transformation is that all three of these things are incredibly important, but where you start is important as well, okay? If we start with practices and we think the structure and the culture is going to emerge, or we start with culture and we think the practices and the structure are going to emerge, I would suggest that's not the way it works, right? We have to be able to get the fundamentals right and then support that with great practices and then coach culture over time, because culture takes a long time to change. Okay, so that's the, the hypothesis that I'm starting this talk on. Okay, awesome. Okay, so what do I mean by structure? So it was interesting, as I went through this deck, I realized that my thinking on this has evolved. And so I did this talk in 2014, and then I did a talk called The Three Things You Need to Know to Transform Any Size Organization into an Agile Enterprise. You can clearly see I am not good at writing short talk titles. Okay, so, so what I did is I lifted this next slide sequence out of my three things talk, okay? And so I started to tell the story this way. And then we kind of built on it this year and did this thing called the Executive's Guide to Leading Large-Scale Agile Transformations, which is really just kind of a progressive um, kind of realization of what we've been doing. And so when I talked about the things in Agile that have gotten abstracted behind the manifesto and the practices of Scrum, I would suggest are these three simple things. Teams, backlogs, working tested software, okay? If you don't have those three things, nothing you do with Scrum is gonna work. No cultural change that you guys want to install is going to happen, okay? It's, my, it's, it's what I'm banking on for the next hour or so. So what do I mean when I talk about a backlog? I can't tell you how many people I say, do you guys have a backlog? 
and they say, yeah, of course we have a backlog. And then I ask what it is, and it's just this series of like thematic things that the product owner wants to build, okay? They span sprints, they can't be done in a couple days, right? The team can't swarm around them. Or on the other extreme, what we get is a bunch of engineering activities in the backlog, okay? When you press a room and you say, what is a backlog? Right, I always go back to the Mike Cohn, Bill Wake stuff, invest. Independent, negotiable, valuable, estimatable, small, and testable. Okay? Things that can, you can pull one in, take another thing out. Um, valuable in the language of the customer. Small, can be done in a day or two. Testable, I know when I'm done. Right? And then estimatable, I need to know how big it is if I'm going to pull it into a sprint. And when I very first did this, I can't remember if it was one of the Scrum gatherings or if it was uh, at Agile 2014, but I had 500 people in the room, right? And I said, who in the room builds backlogs like this? Not one person built backlogs that way. What is that? Yeah, not one person, okay? Because what you find is that in most large organizations, the, the infrastructure, decision-making, roles and responsibilities, is not incredibly clear, right? Who has to come together to build that backlog, okay? Because most large organizations fall into the trap of the next thing, right? How do we form a complete cross-functional team? What does that even mean at scale, okay? So back in the day, I had always read <clears throat> six to eight people, everything and everyone necessary to produce a working tested increment of the product, okay? Well, what does, it, what does that mean when I've got 400 people all working across the code base. What does that mean when I don't have encapsulation? I don't have any kind of services orientation. I don't have any kind of componentization, right? The idea is, is that with, with Agile, an Agile team is basically like an intersection of, and this is a little bit uh, jargony, but like business architecture, technology architecture, and organizational architecture. I need a business problem I need an encapsulated piece of that architecture, and I need a dedicated team to deliver it. And when you have that, right, put a product owner in front of it, right, and maybe you're good. But most large organizations, due to technology challenges, organizational challenges, business process challenges, all those kinds of things, can't form the kinds of teams. That same 500 people, how many people are forming that kind of a team? Nobody in the room raises their hand. Maybe three or four, but like not a lot, right, given the size of the room. Okay, and so when you get really specific about what do I mean by a backlog and what do I mean by a team, most people aren't doing it. Okay, the third element, the ability to produce something of value every sprint. Now, <clears throat> does anybody know what the definition of done is? You guys heard that? <laughs> right, okay, cool. Is anybody so serious about done that they don't call it done anymore, they call it done done? <laughs> right, done done, right? How about dun, dun, dun? Anybody that serious about it, right? Okay, the reason why Agilists like done so much, okay, is that when something is done, I get to check it off the list. A lot of project managers in DC, I used to be a project manager. The problem with project management often is it's traditionally done in software, is that you get this 90% done, 90% left to go kind of a thing. Or we've written all the lines of code, but yeah, it's not really tested. Or maybe it's tested, but we don't have all the defects worked out of it. Or we have most of the defects worked out, but it's not quite ready to deploy. Or the customer hasn't looked at it, or it hasn't been signed off on. We like to take partial credit as project managers in the software industry, okay? The problem with partial credit is that when you get to where you're towards the end of the project, you don't know how much work is left to do. Every time you leave technical debt, every time you leave a defect, every time you leave something partially done, what's happening is that there's an indeterminate, non-estimated backlog that's building in secret. Fair? Yeah. Okay. So when you hold to your definition of done, 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 what you're saying is that done is important. Because here's the thing to me, when I was early in Agile, that separated Agile from total chaos. If I know the size of my backlog, and I know the velocity of the team, I can start to anticipate how far we have left to go in the backlog, or how many sprints it's gonna to take to get it done. You guys with me? Okay, <clears throat> think about it. If you don't have a backlog that's estimated, 
and you don't have a team that stays together, they won't establish a stable velocity, by the way, and you can't get to done, you have no idea where you're at in that project. Is that fair? Okay, so the challenge is, is that what you have to do is you have to really sit and evaluate and ask yourself, do I have the three things? Now, if I have the three things, would it be possible for me to ask somebody to go grab me a bottle of water? I had one a little bit ago. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, ah, thank you. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so, so if you have the three things, that's what I call structure. Sometimes I'll call it systems. If you have great systems in place, if you have great structure in place, then all of the practices around Scrum start having meaning. Okay? Now, the interesting thing is, is getting into this idea of like this cargo cult Scrum, it's like a daily stand-up doesn't fix this. Okay? Almost every single problem associated with sprint planning comes from the fact that the product owner doesn't come with a ready backlog. The precondition for sprint planning is that the product owner shows up with a ready backlog that meets those criteria, right? The team has to be able to get together in those first couple hours and figure out what the plan for the next two weeks looks like. They have to be able to get to a definition of done. Every failure mode that I see in Scrum, or XP, or SAFE, or whatever, right? I'm just picking on Scrum since it's kind of the simplest one is a failure to form teams, build backlogs, or produce working tests and software. We fall in the trap of going, I need a product owner. I don't care whether you guys have a product owner or not, but I do care that you have a backlog, right? I don't care whether you guys have a scrum master or not, but I do care that you guys have impediments removed and we can do all the things, right? So we get really kind of dogmatic into the roles, ceremonies, and artifacts, and we forget these fundamentals. So you know, your homework kind of coming out of here is think about, is there anything in Agile that's going to work the way it's supposed to if these three things aren't in place? Will you be able to get the value out of it that you expect? And I would suggest no. Right? Just kind of an interesting aside, one of the things that we find is that a lot of, a lot of organizations really naturally lend themselves to teams, backlogs, working tests, and software, right? Infrastructure's great, somebody really smart built the architecture, right? The organization is, is really new and, and geared towards Agile. And Agile's just a really simple, natural overlay. But here's the interesting thing about large organizations. They're not, okay? And because we're not being explicit about teams, backlogs, working tests, and software, we're just going through the motions. Okay. Sometimes I'll see CIOs that they're like, oh yeah, when I, we were like this hundred person company, like everything was perfect. We did XP and blah, and I'm going in and trying to sell them this transformation stuff and everything. They go, it's not supposed to be this complicated. I'm like, yeah, but it's because you don't have the fundamentals right, right? The previous organization, you had the fundamentals right. This thing you just inherited is a mess. Okay. So let's talk about what that mess is. Okay. Oh, okay, actually, oh, it's funny, okay, I inserted this uh, set of slides in here and then I totally forgot where I was going, so you guys bear with me here, okay, cool. So one of the things that I think is cool, right, is when you start to go into Teams, Backlogs, Working Tested Software, another way that you can express that, oops, where am I at, is this idea of clarity, accountability, and measurable progress. So by giving a team a backlog, what you're fundamentally giving them is clarity about what you want to build. One of the challenges that I see all the time is that the product guys are flipping some general idea over to the team, letting the team try to figure out what it's supposed to be, and then they're not happy with what they get on the backside. Right? You don't get to abdicate that kind of responsibility. Right? The business has to give the team clarity on what to build in the form of a product owner or some entity that's going to create a backlog for them. Accountability. This is another interesting thing. One of the things that Scrum, all the cultural stuff around Scrum is totally predicated on is the team being able to hold themselves accountable. And I might add, being held accountable by the product owner or the outside stakeholders or what have you, okay? Think about what happens when you don't have a team that stays together. People are matrixed across multiple teams. They've got tons of outside dependencies all around them, right? What starts to happen is the team stops believing that they can make and meet a commitment. They stop believing that the process, process adds any value to them. 
okay? So when you don't keep teams together, it's not just as bad as like, well, we're not gonna stabilize velocity. I, I see that, that teams will stop believing that they can get to a definition of done, okay? They can't hold themselves accountable, nor can they be held accountable by the rest of the organization. And then like I was saying about the 90% done, 90% left to do, is we don't have measurable progress on the backside. A friend of mine in the community actually tied this to, um, tied this to the Dan Pink stuff. Anybody familiar with his book Drive, Autonomy, Mastery, and Purpose? And you know what that's really about is the fact that knowledge workers aren't really driven by money. Like we have to be like taken care of to a point, right? We have to be able to feed our families and take care of our kids and pay our mortgage and all that kind of stuff. But financial incentives actually degrade performance. And so what he talks about is what knowledge workers want is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And it was a really interesting aha moment when I kind of went from backlogs, teams, working tested software, clarity, accountability, measurable progress, to the notion of purpose, autonomy, and mastery. Okay? The backlog gives purpose. Having a complete cross-functional team gives autonomy. The ability to get to a definition of done gives mastery. So if you buy into the Dan Pink stuff and you buy into what I, the argument that I'm laying out here, right? It's like the energy that Scrum is supposed to bring into the company, right? That empowerment, that self-organization, right? Um, being able to be trusted by the company, being self-motivated, um, it breaks down. So I'd suggest that Teams Backlogs Working Tested Software isn't just about how to do Scrum better, but it's about how to engage people better, right? So it's a really interesting thing when you start unpacking this Teams Backlogs Working Tested Software idea. When you start to scale it, it, it starts to look like the words I like to use are, are governance, structure, and metrics. And so governance is an interesting thing. You guys in DC, right, you live governance, I'm sure, right? But, <clears throat> but governance oftentimes in the agile community is a dirty word, right? So I look at governance as just how do I make economic trade-offs in the face of scarce resources, okay? How do I make prioritization decisions? Who gets to decide, okay? If you look at what safe is, Safe is just a governance framework around Scrum, give or take, right? Same with less a little bit, right? Same with disciplined agile delivery. All the scaling frameworks are really just fundamentally governance frameworks, okay? Within them, they have structures. How do we form teams, right? How do we do the things that we're being asked to do? How do we measure? How do we control, okay? So teams, backlogs, working tested software, um, clarity, accountability, measurable progress, autonomy, mastery, purpose, structure, governance, and metrics, right? It's how it all scales up together, okay? So here's the interesting thing, right? When you get into large organizations trying to adopt Agile, <clears throat> the thing that gets in the way of forming teams, building backlogs, producing work and test software, or even structure governance and metrics at scale are dependencies, right? How many of you guys have dependencies in your organization? Oh, the rest of you guys are just lying. Come on, seriously, really? Come on, okay. I can't believe yeah. you guys. Everybody has dependencies. Come on. If you're doing anything non-trivial, there's dependencies, right? Okay, so you go into companies, right? And you start to look at the barriers to Agile. And, and the, this is like the eight that came up top of my mind three years ago when I was building this slide, right? But things like matrix organizations. Okay, it's not so much that a matrix organization is bad in and of itself. But when you have managers that are taking developers and spreading them across multiple projects or QA testers across multiple projects or different development resources or whoever's required to build product and spreading them across multiple things and then moving them around as necessary to load balance the organization, right? You start to violate the principles of forming teams, okay? You start to think about like, okay, well, where do I go when I have a question? Non-instantly available resources. Um, having too much work in process, limited access to subject matter expertise, large products with diverse technology. When I first started getting into Agile, we were building large scale systems of systems in the financial services industry. We had uh, ACH processing engines on the backside, um, PeopleSoft systems, .NET front ends, Java front ends, uh, um, uh, web services, um, Oracle databases, right, all that kind of stuff. This idea of putting eight people together that could do all that stuff and work across the entire stack wasn't gonna happen, right? You get into this idea of when you're building integrated systems of systems, who's the product owner? 
who gets to decide? Because you have a platform strategy and then you have an integration strategy. What you often have is product people at this layer and product people like this, right? Who gets to decide when there's a bottleneck, okay? So those things are real, right? But, but they're, they get in the way of us being able to be agile. Shared requirements between teams, technical debt and defects, low cohesion type coupling, right? Architectural problems. And one time I was doing a flavor of this talk for a group of CIOs in Atlanta, and one of them kind of bravely raises his hand and goes, but Mike, that's what I deal with, right? This is the world that I live in. And I said, yeah, right? But every single dependency, every single thing you leave in place reduces agility. Think about it. What is Agile, right? Nobody adopts Agile because they just want to do Scrum and they like daily standups, right? <laughs> Everybody wants to do Agile because they believe that it's going to help them respond to change when they learn new things. Be able to put things in market faster, be able to get feedback, start generating early return on investment, right? There's all kinds of reasons that people want to apply Scrum. And so the interesting thing is, is that in the presence of dependencies, in the presence of these architectural challenges in organizations, you don't have the ability to achieve agility. You have the ability to do agile, but you don't have the ability to achieve agility. And so it's really interesting, right? So when you start with culture, you're assuming that if everybody just got it, they would self-organize this stuff away. I have a buddy who might actually be watching. He's going to know I'm talking about him if, uh, if he's actually watching this. But um, he's been on a journey for about 10 years within his organization to refactor their back end. Okay? Um, it's requiring incredibly intentional investment okay, at, the, at the highest levels of the organization to progressively start to refactor this stuff, okay? So suggesting that we're gonna get everybody interested in Agile and that investment's gonna kind of magically happen, it's a little bit of wishful thinking, right? Um, just saying, I want to do Scrum, it's, you know, so what is the expression? Scrum doesn't fix anything, Scrum just shows you your impediments, right? Those are the impediments that it's showing you. Okay, I'm pointing at that screen, but that screen, right? Those are the impediments it's showing you. So one of the things that I think is that we're being disingenuous with our leaders sometimes when we start with culture or we start with practices. And we say, it's just gonna show us our impediments and we have to fix them. Well, the fixing them are major, major investments sometimes. They're major reorganizations sometimes. And so what I think we have to start doing is we start thinking about how to, um, how to evangelize this stuff in companies, we have to start being more direct with the kinds of things that are gonna get, get in the way. But Mike, we don't know everything that's gonna get in the way. Absolutely, we don't know everything. But I think we probably know 70, 80, 90% of it. Okay, we can create a hypothesis around the rest of it. Okay, we don't have to pretend that we're making it up from scratch. We know that this stuff is gonna get in the way. Right, so we need to start being on top of that. I'm gonna pause for a second and take a drink of water. You guys have any questions? Thoughts you guys buy my premise so far? Well, you put up, you put up three things. Yep. Culture, <clears throat> practices, and structure. You're yep. talking about where to start. Yeah. I think you're saying start with structure. I am right? saying you start with structure. Yeah. We're going to go deeper into that here in a little bit. So I'm building an argument for you, right? So we talk about where does it come from? Where does this culture stuff come from? Where does the practices stuff come from? Okay, and then once I get really specific about this team's backlogs working tested software, I'm holding out a standard for you guys that I think that most of you guys probably aren't achieving in your organizations. Okay, you guys might be doing Scrum really well, maybe you're doing Safe really well, but I bet you most of the folks in the room aren't getting the business benefit from it that they want. But here's the thing, so now I'm giving everybody in the room a pass because it's not totally everybody's fault, okay? These organizations are messed up, okay? But the challenge is if we actually want to achieve agility, we have to start getting really real about what we're doing, right? We have to start getting really real about the problem that we're trying to solve. So kind of the transformation theory that we came up with is adopting Agile is fundamentally about forming teams, building backlogs, producing working tested software. It's not about principles and practices and who's the product owner and do we have a good, you know, whatever, right? Backlogs, teams, working, test of software. 
At scale, it's about defining a, um, a lean governance framework. It's about creating networks of teams and collaboration all the way up the enterprise. It's about the metrics and tools that enable agility. And then anything that gets in the way of forming teams, building backlogs, producing working tests of software, putting in lean governance, networks of teams, and metrics at scale is an impediment that ultimately has to be removed. Not to do scrum, not to do safe, but to achieve agility. Okay? Question. Yeah. Or comment. I guess I agree with a lot, a lot of what you're saying, but I guess one thing I have trouble with is you mentioned clarity. Yeah. And, and, and also business value. Mm -hmm. um, don't you think that in this world, mm -hmm. right, that there is no sort of a single step way that you're just going to know where you're <clears> going? <throat> and, that, and that to me, agility is about creating a situation where you can exploit anti-fragile behaviors so you can get take advantage of fleeting opportunities. Yeah. How do you do that with clarity? Well, so so here's the interesting thing, okay? Some business, we're going to get in this in, the, into, in a section or two from now, is that, is that, sure, right? I mean, the ability to respond rapidly to market, the ability to respond to change, the ability to do all these things. The challenge is, is that in order to do that, you have to have an infrastructure that supports it. Okay, you have to have good architecture, you have to have good team organization, you have to have all those kinds of things. Now I'm gonna break down some different dimensions to think about um, where you fall in different continuums, but I would suggest that not even every company is that right now. So bear with me here, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna hit your, your question here in a little bit. Okay, so solid agile practices will help operationalize a system and encourage a healthy, adaptive, empowered culture emerge over time. So build the systems, get the barriers out of the way, the practices and the culture come next. That's the point that I'm trying to make to this point. Okay? So we're gonna pivot here. Right? So now we're gonna have like a shift in ideas. Okay, the first thing is I was building the case for teams, backlogs, working tests, and software, structure, governance, and metrics, but most importantly, the case for breaking dependencies. Okay, now what we're gonna have to figure out is what do we do in the presence of dependencies while we're trying to remove them? What do we do with our organizational culture the way it is while we're trying to get it to be more adaptive, right? While we're trying to get it to be able to respond to change. And so a couple years ago, we invented this little model we call our compass or four quadrants, okay? And one of my proudest moments, and I probably shouldn't say this on video, but um, one of the coolest things was, um, I think when I first rolled this out, Agile 2015, um, one of the guys from Jeff Sutherland's organization came to my talk, and then they talked about this in their talk. And uh, scrum.org has since done some videos around it. So it's like the first thing that I feel like I've ever really contributed that like a, a serious other thought leader actually like picked up on and used, right? So it kind of gave some credence to this, and I think it's a really valuable insight. So a, a couple years ago when I first started writing about um, some of the challenges that we were having adopting Agile in different companies, um, I started talking about the fact that, kind of to your point, that certain companies are built for predictability, okay? Certain companies are built for change. Certain companies value predictability. Certain companies value change. So like a really key indicator is if you value predictability, is if you're doing annual planning cycles, projectized organizations, trying to put together gigantic interdepartmental Gantt charts, right, trying to resource level across the whole year, right, trying to figure out exactly how much scope you're gonna be able to build for how much money and all that kind of stuff, not, no value judgment, but rest assured your organization values predictability. That's what it's going for, okay? There are organizations Right, a lot of the new web startups, my company, I'm sure, Accelerate, right? a lot of, maybe some of you guys that really value and are built for change. You recognize that the markets are changing and that things are gonna be all over the place. So you can build your organization from the ground up. Most of the time when I run this exercise with the executives and I say, okay, do you want predictability or do you wanna be able to respond to change? What do you think they say? Both. Yes, of course, right? They want both, right? And so the only thing we want people to recognize at this point is that the more you strive to get predictability, the harder it is to respond to change, okay? The easier you make it to respond to change, the harder it is to make and meet commitments, okay? There's a tension, 
right? So one of the things we try to do is just get rec executives to reconcile that there's a tension, okay? And so most of them can do it, by the way, yeah. So on the vertical axis, we talk about emergence versus convergence. And those are unfortunate words, but I can't think of any better words to use. And we've tried a bunch of them, by the way, so don't like send me emails with suggestions, right? I've just decided I'm going forward with this, right? But emergence for me is <clears throat> like Google, right? If you think about what Google sells, they sell data, they sell advertising. What does Google build, right? All kinds of stuff, right? What do their products do? All kinds of things. Right? Whatever the market will bear to, so they can collect your data and sell it to people and sell you advertising is what they build. Doesn't matter. <clears throat> How many government contracts are there that it doesn't matter what you build for your customer? <laughs> so probably not many is what I'm hearing, right? So here's a bucket of money. Just go build me whatever you think's cool. Right? Inspect and adapt in the market. You know, missile system can do whatever it wants to do. Carrier can do whatever it needs to do, right? All that kind of stuff. So on the other end of that extreme, talk about the idea of convergence, right? And so certain markets value emergence, right? Very lean startup, inspect and adapt, figure it out as you go, kind of like what you were talking about. And then on the other side, other markets value um, I call it convergence because at the beginning of a project, no matter how much we think we know about it, there are aspects that we're figuring out as we go, right? So we're taking a ton of risk and uncertainty and we're trying to converge upon a time, cost, and scope outcome that's acceptable to the customer. So emergence is I start with a business goal and I can build whatever I need to do to solve it. Convergence is I start with risk and uncertainty and I'm trying to drive towards a time, cost, and scope, okay? So when I started writing about this, I started writing about the nature of organizations and the nature of markets. And then I kind of accidentally coined this idea of the predictive convergent organization and the adaptive emergent organization. And kind of to your point, what I was thinking about is in the upper right quadrant, the adaptive emergent, that's where us as agilists, we want everybody to be. Okay, because in an adaptive emergent organization, we don't value uh, making any commitments, we value responding to change, we want to do the best thing for our customer based on what we know today, right? All that kind of stuff. Great, greatness, right? On the other side, the predictive convergent organization, I was talking about companies that are built for predictability, trying to make and meet specific commitments, right? There are companies like that, okay? And as agilists, a lot of times, what we're trying to do is we're trying to sell an adaptive emergent way of doing business to a company that values a predictive convergent way of operating. That's why it feels like a cultural thing, okay, sometimes, right? If they just saw it, right, if they just could get it, right, they would get it. I'm telling you, I don't see a world in which government contracts are written that way, right? I mean, there's going to be a place where companies want to make and meet commitments, okay? And so as I was building this out, I was thinking about predictive convergent and adaptive emergent, and then I had this aha moment one Sunday morning. I went up to my office, and I wrote the quadrant and put these things on the axis, and I said, okay, we have two... Um, squares on a two by two grid, right? Do the other two exist? And it was fascinating because when I filled them in, I came up with predictive emergent and adaptive convergent. And it took me a little bit of a while to figure it out, but if you think about it, right, does anybody work in a company that values predictability, has all of the structures and everything for making and meet, all the planning, right, all that stuff, but stuff's changing all the time? Does anybody work in that kind of environment? Okay, yeah, so, so the words that I, I started off using is that's an irrational place to be, right? You can't make and meet commitments if you don't know what you're building and it's changing all the time, right? You just can't, okay? Um, and so some words that we've used over time are things like ad hoc. Um, somebody came up with a really good one that's way more politically correct called heroic, right? <laughs> a heroic organization. I mean, they're getting things done, but they're doing it with death marches and, and you know, like individuals that are just killing themselves to get this stuff done, right? What we find is that most companies that are trying to adopt Agile are in this upper left quadrant, right? They're, they're, they're built for predictability because there's tremendous uncertainty in what they want to build. They're using that as an impetus for going to Agile. Challenges is that the organization doesn't always value those things. 
the organization's customers don't always value those things. So then just to build out the model, the adaptive conversion, that was the hardest one. Because how do you make and meet commitments, right, to a time, cost, and scope, but still keep the option open for change? And what really the aha moment was that's batch size, right? You make smaller commitments. So if you think about everything in Scrum or Safe, right, it's all about the two to four week commitment or the PI every six to 12 weeks, right, the quarterly release plan, right, create opportunities to change. Doesn't mean you have to change, but we create opportunities to change. So the way it kind of built out is I talked about the stock model. Traditional tends to live in the lower left quadrant. Agile is in the lower right quadrant. And then Lean Startup is in the upper right quadrant. So one of the exercises I like to go through with people and companies is I say, where do you think you are? You know what's really fascinating? I've done this exercise with folks, and there'll be like 12 executives in a room, and they all identify in a different place on the quadrant. <coughs> it's fascinating, right? And so you can use this as a way to say, okay, where are we now, and where would we like to be? And we're going to go a little bit deeper into that. But here's the thing. I want to make sure, okay, cool. I was going to make sure I got my slide sequence right. So this is going to be the first half of the title of the talk, Why Agile Fails. Okay? It's a big buildup just to get to the first like, line of the talk. Okay? <laughs> so why does Agile fail? Most organizations that are trying to adopt Agile, I believe, large organizations, are in the upper left quadrant. They're built for predictability. They value predictability. They're organized for predictability. But because either their market is changing so fast or because they haven't put the time and energy into fully eliciting their requirements, it feels very ad hoc. It feels emergent, like it's changing all the time. Okay? So we're going to tie some concepts together. So what they do is that they do an agile pilot in the upper right quadrant. Okay? So here's the interesting thing. In the upper right, <clears throat> they put six to eight people in a room. They give them an on-site customer. They can produce something of value every couple of sprints. You guys see where I'm going here? Okay, they create all the perfect conditions for exist. They release it from its governance constraints. Okay, and they take the best and the brightest and they get them over in the corner and they just do agile. And you know what? Scrum works when you do that. Fair? Okay, so now we've done our Scrum pilot. And now what do we do? We say, okay, let's pick another project or two. But we matrix people into the organization and we hold them to the same governance. And you know, what we, so what we're basically doing is we're putting the adoption of Agile back into the, to the left, upper left quadrant. Okay? So what I think is Agile is failing is because we pilot in the upper right quadrant, we give out all the conditions, and then we take the practices and sometimes the mindset and we overlay it on top of our broken organization that's full of dependencies. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And so the next part we have to try to struggle with is what do we do about it, right? How do we overcome this? Because the, the inarguable set of truths that I'm trying to anchor on is if we believe that it's teams, backlogs, working tests, and software, if we believe that true agility comes from breaking dependencies, not by applying Scrum, Okay, how do we get to a greater, uh, better organized, dependency-free environment over time? Okay, and so when we first started kind of trying to untangle this, we've gotten a little bit more mature around it, is what we started talking about was this idea of, <clears throat> in the upper left quadrant, it's incredibly low trust. And one of the things, what do agilists like to say, right? They like to say, well, just trust us, right? Just trust us, right? Empower the teams, and the teams are going to do awesome stuff. But I'm telling you, teams doing awesome stuff on top of broken organizations does not lead to greater um, agility. It doesn't lead to any of the business benefits. I tell you, I have project managers that will call us periodically, and they'll be like, yeah, we're trying to do everything right. We're trusting the teams, empowering the teams, but they won't make and meet a commitment. They won't tell us when they're going to be done. And you know what? They got to there. They ran out of money, and they didn't have everything finished, and we didn't know it. Right? Well, if I had a backlog and I knew its size and I had a stable velocity and I could anticipate and I was getting to a definition of done, I would have been able to solve that problem. Okay? But the reality is, is a lot of times they can't. Okay? And so it's very low trust. So saying just trust me is often not good for the organization, right? Because the teams have not demonstrated trustworthiness. The environment 
that the teams are operating within does not lend themselves to being able to make and meet commitments. Okay? So kind of our initial hypothesis in this was what we should do is instead of asking the organization to trust us, we should get the organization to become trustworthy. Okay? And what I talked about initially was the idea of becoming predictable, getting really good clean backlogs, getting really solid velocity, being able to start to anticipate scope and duration and all those kinds of things, getting really rock solid about it. Okay? Now, here's the thing. We don't want to do that with you know, <coughs> traditional project management. So what you do is you do that with a combination of kind of lean agile techniques. Sometimes in this quadrant, I talk about team-based, iterative and incremental, um, but more highly governed, more highly plan driven. So in this quadrant, I might be doing things like annual roadmaps broken into quarters, three to six month release plans, really strict kind of three month backlogs, right? Not the, let me just make it up as I go, but putting in the constructs to drive some of the certainty that you're talking about, okay? Um, another interesting thing is, I don't know if any of you guys are like Gartner subscribers, but Gartner talks about this idea of bimodal. What we find is that there are certain organizations with certain parts of their infrastructure that actually need to stay in this predictable quadrant. I mean, how many people want a bunch of 24-year-old Agilists working on their mainframe banking system? <laughs> Serious, right? You guys, you guys cool if your bank balance is off? We'll just fix it next sprint, <laughs> right? I mean, there's certain things, systems of record, right? Things that, are more, that have to be more stable. Sometimes it's okay to kind of stay in that lower left quadrant, okay? For the things that want to move, right, as we move to the right, we start thinking about how to reduce batch size, right? That's through a combination of program and portfolio management changes. Sometimes it's release management. Sometimes it's breaking dependencies. Sometimes it's technical architecture, testing practices, DevOps, things like that, right? That's what's required to move over to the right. And then as you move up and you actually have fully decoupled teams operating around autonomous increments of the product, now we can start to think about doing more disruptive innovation within those platforms. So what's interesting is that as a group of practitioners, what you guys have to figure out is which quadrant are you in and which quadrant do you want to get to? And what's interesting is sometimes that's not driven by you guys, sometimes that's driven by the people that are paying the bills and what they're willing to invest, okay? And I think, again, a core challenge that we have is that what we believe is agilous is either A, not technically feasible, given the constraints within the organization, or it's not where the organization wants to be. So doing a transformation is often a lot about meeting the organization where it is, helping it be successful in place, and then making incremental systematic improvements that help increase agility over time. You got a squinchy face, man. You got a question? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, maybe a, more like a, a comment. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> it, it seems like you're, you're kind of building up from a foundation. And the first step is to get, would, would you say that getting the backlog under control mm -hmm. is really, is really the, the foundation <clears throat> moving from quadrant one to quadrant one? It's, it's the three things, man. It's backlogs, teams, working tested software. Okay, but sometimes the challenge becomes is that, um, is that forming teams when you don't have the right organizational structures in place or forming teams when, you're, when you don't have the right number of people to staff the teams in place or trying to create autonomous teams when you have dependencies, right? I mean, there's lots of different things, right? Trying to get smaller batch size when the organization wants longer term planning. So what you find is that usually, and we're gonna, I'm gonna go through this in a little bit more detail in the next slide sequence, but stabilizing the system requires a lot more energy than people are putting into it today, okay? Like just the idea of what you said of building a backlog, you know, putting a BA and calling them a product owner and telling them to show up with user stories is not usually sufficient in these environments. I mean, a lot of times we're creating small working groups of architects, project managers, analysts, maybe five or six people almost operating in a kind of scrum team of their own that do nothing but decompose backlog forward and deep, 
okay, that are feeding multiple scrum teams integrated dependency aware backlog, subordinate to a higher level portfolio kind of a thing, right? So there's a lot of elements in safe that are, that are really sound, right? If, you, if we really unpack the model, I think I've got some slides in here, we'll see how far we get. But the idea is, is that, um, is that the level of rigor and discipline required is greater than most organizations are currently putting into it or are able to put into it. One of the big challenges with backlogs is if you think about it, <clears throat> and I say this flippantly early on the talk, but it's like if you put a product person in front of a technical team, they're just saying, hey man, I wanna go climb this mountain, go figure it out, right? If you're really gonna empower that team to go do it at their own pace and their own scope, and oh, okay, right? But if you're trying to get eight or 10 teams or 100 teams, to operate, operate in an integrated fashion in a tightly coupled, poorly architected kind of environment, ain't gonna happen, right? You're gonna create gridlock. Okay, because the challenge is, is that as those teams figure out their backlog, they realize, oh, I gotta go get something from somebody else, and they go on the app, and the team is going to self-organize them away. Okay, if you have dependencies, you have to manage them. If you have encapsulation, if you don't have encapsulation, you have to have orchestration. As you get greater encapsulation, you can reduce orchestration. As we get the organization right, we can reduce the level of planning and overhead. That makes sense? So that's kind of the premise that I'm going for here. And so I gave you guys my theory of transformation. So kind of corollary one is agile can mean different things to different companies and not all approaches will work well in every organization. You can't come at a government contractor always with a lean startup approach. Right? If there's a specific date, a specific amount of money, and a specific scope, I would suggest you have to respect that. If there's dependencies and poor architecture and all that kind of stuff I've been talking about, you can't pretend that Scrum, team level Scrum, is gonna make it go away. Right? You have to have a strategy for, for working that stuff out and resolving it. Okay? Sometimes safe will work, sometimes won't. Sometimes less will work, sometimes it won't. Sometimes it's just lean, agile program governance on top of Scrum. Okay, but one of the things that I spend, I feel like I spend a lot of time doing is giving people permission to plan forward if they need to. Well, but Mike, that's not agile. Well, I'm like, well, tell me how else you're gonna resolve all these dependencies and, and have some reasonable assurance you're gonna deliver on time. Okay, so a lot of times in that lower left quadrant, it's team-based, it's iterative and incremental, but it's still governed, it still has a lot of planning around it. You guys with me? Okay, and then as you progress around the quadrants, you can start pulling some of that stuff apart, but it's all around encapsulation, right? And then, yeah, Are go you for it. Well, so, so when you look at, when you say planning cycles within Scrum, I would kind of say like, well, what does that mean, right? I mean, Scrum in its simplest form is the product owner sits down with the Scrum team on every two week intervals. Maybe they get together every three months and do release planning, right? I mean, do all that stuff. But what I find is that the level of visibility into the backlog has to be um, more tightly coordinated. Like I'll tell you one time, one thing that's interesting I don't think people realize is how pragmatic guys like Jeff Sutherland are. Like I was sitting at dinner with him one time and I was like, hey, I find that the single product owner metaphor doesn't work all the time, right? I, sometimes I need to get a group of people together and create like this working group and they do the backlogs and all that and he goes, yeah, yeah, do that. And I went, but that's not what the Scrum Guide says. It, well, I, th I think these guys intend for us to take the patterns and extend them and do what works. I don't think they intend for us to, to simply apply them in a stupid way that doesn't work, okay? If it's not working, don't keep doing it, okay? Just because Agile says to do it, right? So the idea is, is that what I need is, is I don't need product owners operating in scrum cadences. What I need is backlogs that are dependency aware that the teams can start processing without thrashing around in the sprint. Make sense? It's very nuanced. If a single product owner can give that to you, by all means, right? But if they can't, or you don't have one that can, then you gotta do something else. Because I don't need product owners, I need backlogs. It's a really subtle distinction, right? Okay? Yeah, okay. So we have to have the ability to adapt it to our current set of constraints, okay? So one of the things that we talk about is we talk about this idea of creating an Agile journey, okay? And a lot of us, when we pick up the book on Agile, we want to be able to um, 
just go right out of the gate and just do Agile. If you can form teams, build backlogs, produce a working tested increment, by all means, pick up the book on Agile and start doing Agile, start doing Scrum, start doing XP, right? But if you have dependencies, if you can't form teams, if you can't build backlogs, if you can't get to a working tested increment, adopting Agile by the book isn't going to solve the problem. Okay, so what we generally find is I was actually, when we first created this, I was, I was kind of a little dogmatic about this path, but we've learned that there are ways of going straight from one quadrant to the other if you're willing to create the conditions for that quadrant to work. So but I'm not gonna go deep into that, but what I'm gonna talk about is that in most large organizations trying to adopt Agile, the path goes something like this, okay? And, okay, I wanna see what's on my slides, okay. Okay, cool. I want to make sure I didn't get ahead of myself here. Okay, cool. So a lot of times what it boils down to is that if I'm going to go from this chaotic, heroic, irrational, ad hoc state, the first thing is I have to do is I have to build trust with the organization and I have to become predictable using lean agile techniques. Often that requires forming teams, getting higher level constructs in place to be able to break down backlogs, create dependency aware backlogs, to deal with bottlenecks in the system, to deal with some of the challenges that we're gonna have because we don't have all the right things in place. We have to plan in the presence of dependencies. We have to subordinate to existing contracts, to existing portfolio governance, all that kind of stuff. It's not gonna go away day one. Okay, so the first step in this kind of journey can be let's stabilize the system. Let's don't go straight towards okay, we just have to make it up as we go because things are changing, right? Let's put the energy into stabilizing the system. Step two, let's start moving towards reducing batch size. If we're doing 12 month projects, let's do six month projects. If we're doing six months, let's do three months. If we're doing three months, let's do six weeks, okay? What kinds of things have to improve in the system to be able to deliver or plan more frequently? Sometimes that's technology practices. Sometimes it's release management. Sometimes it's a little bit of DevOps. Sometimes it's a little bit of working with the organization on program and portfolio governance. Lots of different ways to attack that problem. But step two is, is we've stabilized, now let's get things in market a little bit faster, okay? Now, there's gonna be a lot of organizations, as I mentioned, um, banks, uh, mainframe platforms, systems of records, Gartner Remote One kinds of things that probably don't ever need to be any more agile than this. And if that's your level of agility, that is probably okay, okay? Because here's the thing, you can get a lot of this agility without doing like major refactoring of your platform. Step three, if you really want to start unpacking this, we have to start making platform changes. Services orientation, componentization, breaking the app into smaller feature sets, right? Whatever that means to you guys to decouple. Usually where heavy DevOps comes in, legacy refactoring kinds of things. Um, probably not all of your organization needs to go through this step. Maybe it's just the, the strategic pieces that need to be pulled out and decoupled, right? There's ways of kind of thinking about that. But step three is kind of that hurdle to get through if you want to truly have team-based kind of organizations. Now here's the interesting thing. What I think SAFE is doing is it safe is taking these upper left um, chaotic kinds of organizations and it's putting a planning wrapper around the value stream. Does that make sense? Okay, it's basically saying this is the thing you're going to deliver. We're gonna do these um, big room planning sessions. We're gonna get everybody into the room to do that. And what it's basically doing is it's saying, okay, dependencies are gonna live here in the center, okay? And we're not gonna try to break them or refactor them, at least there's not being explicit about it and we're gonna wrap it in this planning thing. That's why SAFE is so big and heavy and requires so many more roles and so much more definition. It's like SAFE gets kind of mocked in the industry sometimes by people that like really want small light agile. But what Dean's pragmatically doing is he's saying dependencies exist. We gotta wrap them and we gotta deal with them. Okay, yeah. So, and, and it's SAFE because it's PI planning session, mm -hmm. which is when you're supposed to find all the dependencies. Yeah. Yeah. Together yeah. They don't know. They don't know. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. You've got to yeah. constantly be proactively finding them for the team. Yeah, absolutely. So that's actually the failure mode that I see most common with safe, safe implementations is that they go through the motions of safe, 
okay? But because the teams aren't encapsulated, they don't have stable velocity, there's too many internal dependencies, those dependencies are not being forward managed very well, that they, they actually don't find them. So you get, now we're starting to get a lot of people that are really going through the motions of SAFE, but they're not able to deliver on a steady cadence a predictable increment back to the business. Okay, but the fundamental failure mode of safe is the same thing that's killing scrum just at a larger scale. Okay, it really is. It's fascinating. So if the value stream is truly encapsulated, like if you walked into a company that had seven or eight scrum teams and they were was relatively new and they, they could do the big room planning or as a division or a group or something that had true encapsulation, you probably could do that. Okay, but there's a lot of environments where the value streams are even overlapping. Okay, so again, it's all about applying the method into the context it was intended to operate in. If the context is broken, you've got to fix the context, right? You don't want to change the process. So there's a lot of failure modes with SAFE right now, too. But what SAFE's kind of doing is it's kind of saying, okay, we're going to jump over phase one, phase two. We're going to go straight to phase three, and we're going to stay there. So I would suggest that in some ways, SAFE is in a, in, ineffective in its, a, in its ability to forward plan, right? Because you're not going to figure that out in that two-day meeting. But then it also falls short of agility sometimes because it's not focusing on decoupling, right? How you're forming teams, right? How you're breaking the dependency, how you're improving the system. That's a process wrapper, okay? So I was with a client uh, last week, and it was like, they were, they were kind of bought into a safe implementation and we were kind of like crafting some language that said, okay, this is how, what it takes to do safe well here. So if you don't have the conditions to do safe, we're going to have to do some safe plus, right, which is the lower left quadrant stuff, right? If you've got some organizations that need to move faster than safe, then we want to start deprecating some of the control as we improve the system. Okay, so we started talking about safe plus, safe minus, right? And, and again, I think, I think Dean would agree with that, right? Dean's not dogmatic about any of this kind of stuff. It's us who apply these things in a dogmatic way. Okay, because the challenge is that these guys that are doing methodology, they have to get it so specific that we'll buy it and come to certifications and it can be trained on and all that kind of stuff, which is fair, okay? But at the same time, a lot of times we don't check our brains in with us and actually help to adapt the methodologies the way they're supposed to be adapted. Okay, but if you can truly get over some of the dependency hump, okay, then what can start to happen is now we can start to think about team-based project deliverables. Like the holy grail to me of Agile is your team, right, you've got a responsibility for a feature set, I'm approving work for you, right? Think about it, you had a single product owner, project to do, break it down in the backlog, you have a single team that's doing it, right, that's pure play scrum. Right? That's the way it's supposed to work when, it, when you don't have a ton of dependencies. And then if you moved even further past that, fully decoupled um, team-based funding, you could now say, if you want to get to kind of to where you're talking about earlier, is I'm not even going to give you a project with a specific set of requirements. What I'm going to give you is a goal, like go take this market, right? Go improve this, make it 50% better, or do A-B testing, right? Figure out what the market needs, how it needs to evolve. But you've got to get there, is my point. Right? Just trying to change somebody's mindset and wanting them to operate differently, I'm suggesting, isn't going to work. You've got to improve the system. Okay? How are we doing on time, by the way? Just let me see where we're at. So it's about 8. Do we have 30 minutes or do we have? Uh, 15. 15? Okay. So I'm going to start blowing through some slides here. Okay, go ahead. Could you talk a little bit <clears throat> about how you decide or what criteria you might think about? <clears throat> Yeah, nor should they. So yeah, absolutely. About yeah, so I, 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 I yeah, so so generally, it's like I kind of like last year I went to the Gartner conference and I listened to I, all I went was the bimodal, right? Because I think bimodal has been talked about very poorly in the industry, and so what I find is that it tends to become like one of the metaphors they used is like APIs and App Store. Okay, they were talking about systems of record versus systems of innovation. So things that are like systems of record, the APIs, the back end, the things that need to be more stable, high volume transactions, right? They don't change as much. Those tend to be candidates for the lower left quadrant, okay? Also things that maybe they need to change, but because of the expense associated with decoupling that are, or improving the organization, there's certain things that might just need to be left down there on the lower left. 
things like mobile, web, pieces of the, the components that really need to innovate fast, things that actually aren't um, as much systems of record but more systems of innovation, those things can pull forward. Okay, so I kind of look at Gartner mode one as the lower left, Gartner mode two is the, is the upper right, and then there's going to be some things that are going to have to pass through the middle, okay, or maybe they pass through the middle or they just kind of stay over in that lower right quadrant, because not everything needs to be disruptive innovation. Sometimes it just needs to be small batches and get things in market faster and learn and all that kind of thing. I mean, there's a lot of, it's really funny, sometimes we think that because we don't know everything, we don't know anything. A lot of people have a pretty good idea of what they want to build. They just need to get really good at figuring out how to go build it, right? Um, the further you go around this arc, the more options you create for yourself. That's what I would suggest. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, okay, cool. So um, what I'm suggesting is that organizational change can be mapped out in a way that outcomes are measurable and predictable and economically justified. And so my talk that I did this past year with the executives guide was really all around really this one slide. It's like, and the point that I kind of started off with is that even if we want to have a self-organized agile transformation where the organization just inspects and adapts into a better way of working, most of these executives, sometimes these guys are going to the, to the board for millions of dollars to make these changes and improvements. And we have to be better as, an, as a community in communicating how we're going to make these changes. What is our hypothesis? How do we know that it's valid? How do we know we're getting the outcomes and the improvements that we said we were going to get for the dollars that we spent? Right? I think that's a fair place to be. So what this begins to do is that when we, when we think about the nature of transformation as forming teams, building backlogs, working tests and software, structure governance metrics, breaking dependencies over time, and you start to think about how we map that transformation, what's the start and what's the end, we start to have like a mental model for how we could actually plan our own transformation. Okay? And one of the things I'd always kind of heard, and this is another thing that gets really misapplied, is the idea of using Scrum to implement Scrum. You guys ever heard that? Right? Well, generally what that means is like take all the tasks that you want to do, all the training, all the whatever, and put them in a backlog and do sprint planning and daily stand-ups and reviews and retrospectives and things like that. What I would suggest is that the fundamental, I, I agree with the idea of using Scrum to implement Scrum, but the unit of value in, a, in an Agile transformation is a transformed organization. Right? So it kind of introduced this idea of iterative and incremental transformation. And so to develop a roadmap, and I'm going to kind of blow through this pretty quick here, but the idea is, is kind of remembering focus on structure, governance, and metrics. Teams at all kinds of different levels of the organization. You'll see a little bit of this reflected in SAFE. This is like a really simple kind of reference architecture. Um, services teams, product teams, program teams, portfolio teams, collaborative cross-functional teams at all levels of the organization. Okay? What you find is in most organizations, they create some sort of hierarchy, some sort of services layer that gets consumed by some sort of product or feature layer that gets coordinated by some sort of program layer that is subordinate to some sort of governance layer. Okay, there tends to be more of these, less of those, okay? Um, is it always three layers or four layers? No, sometimes it's five or six, sometimes it's two, right? Don't build anything more than you have to build. But this is the fundamental pattern. Um, from a governance perspective, Scrum is typically the lower tier governance. Kanban, Lean, is typically the middle tier type governance. Kanban, Lean is typically the program, portfolio governance, right? Portfolio level governance. Metrics. Right? Scrum things that you know and, and love down at the bottom, lean metrics in the middle, lean metrics at the top. Okay? So what I'm suggesting is that, again, when you think about your organization and this structure, governance, and metrics model, you can create a hypothesis around what you would like your organization to look like. Fair? Okay? And if you can create a uh, an idea of what you want it to look like. Oh, okay. I was like, again, I told you, I haven't done this talk in this form in like a couple of years, right? So the point that I was trying to make on this slide is that um, these const constructs and metrics and controls, I believe, can be established without violating Agile principles. But you remember, I've kind of changed the game in my world to be teams, backlogs, working tests, and software, right? Getting things in market fast, being able to get feedback. Okay, so lean's all about reducing batch size, getting things in market faster, getting feedback faster, right? So we're at scrum at the bottom, lean in the middle, lean at the top, okay? 
So what I mean by incremental transformation is that we want to take this structure, governance, and metrics framework, and we want to figure out which piece we want to deal with it first. Okay? So what I'm suggesting here is that you can take your in-state vision, right, your notional idea of what you want structure, governance, and metrics to look like, and you can begin to slice the organization. The primary increment of value of a transformation is a, is a transformed organization up and down this vertical slice. Okay? Now, if you guys remember um, uh, Jeff Patton's uh, Mona Lisa picture, it's a pretty famous picture at this point. You know how he talks about the idea of increments being like the quadrants of the, the Mona Lisa? And then he talks about the iterations being like going from uh, going from like a, a sketch to a watercolor to an early oil painting to like a fully realized oil painting, right? Think about like that, right? So when you look at your entire organization, structure, governance, and metrics, then you can start to think about how to break it up into increments, like the quadrants of the picture. But then from an iterative perspective, you can start to think about um, moving them through those phases that we talked about, right? Stabilize the system, reduce batch size, break dependencies, change your governance, change your innovation strategies, okay? So if you think about it, so what would it be, what would it look like to say, I have a minimally marketable increment of my Agile organization? Minimally marketable Agile isn't like inspect and adapt, empower, let everybody go, figure it out, right? The organization isn't ready for it. So stabilizing the system, in my view, is the minimally marketable uh, increment of an of a Agile transformation. And then as you improve the system, you can start um, releasing control and empowering and letting people go as you actually build the kind of organization that, where that will actually be successful. Okay? Okay. I got a yeah, go for it. In, in practice, let me tell you what the challenge is, right? In practice, most large organizations have taken like a platform strategy and like a product strategy. And so what happens is that the platform spans multiple products. And the challenge is that you have different lines of business that are now expected to share like a common component infrastructure. Okay? And the challenge with that is, is that, is that those GMs have fiscal responsibility to their product, but they don't always have total control over what gets created in a shared system. Okay? So there's usually kind of a balance. So usually the product organization is relatively straightforward. The market segmentation is relatively straightforward. The prioritization comes in is what do I want to do with the shared components? And which is another kind of reason for kind of my case here about this first stage agility, minimally marketable agile, is that let's say I take this vertical slice and some subset of these shared services, right, that are most closely aligned with this group, right? If these guys are doing my iterative and incremental but more planned governed agile, and then these guys are still doing waterfall over here, my stable structured agile will out waterfall the waterfall guys. Okay? And then what happens is that then you get like three or four slices stable to working together, then you can move them and progress them together. Okay? So that's kind of how you start to think about it, right? So agile transformation becomes about, you can actually plan it by saying, we use this word expeditions and base camps. So an expedition is like an increment, base camps are like moving through the journey. So we take an expedition and move it through base camps. Expedition two, move it through base camps. For 10, 15 teams, you can start to kind of predict, right? How long is it going to take to get everybody trained? How long is it going to take to get these things stabilized? What are the things we need to do to round out the teams? What are the key dependencies that we need to manage or break? What are the key architectural constraints that we need to deal with, right? When you stop trying to make, you know, make it up as you go and you really start thinking about the problem, you can actually linearize the problem a bit. Now, are we going to learn or things going to change? Yeah, absolutely, right? Are we going to make mistakes and have to have feedback? Absolutely, right? But, I mean, you can create that hypothesis and really lay that out. And it becomes a really powerful tool for executives in doing change management because now you can say, okay, this million dollars that you guys have to spend this 
you know, quarter or two, right? This is how we're going to spend it. These are the things that we're going to try to improve. This is how we think the organization is going to behave differently when we're done. This is how much faster we're getting things in the market. Here's our metrics baselines, right? This is, you know, it doesn't have to be soft and squishy at this level, right? And so let's see what else I have in here. Okay, so we're talking about iterative and incremental stuff. Organizations can adopt Agile safely and pragmatically by iteratively and incrementally uh, introducing structure, governance, and metrics and maturing practices and culture over time as we create the conditions in the organization for those practices and cultural things to thrive. Okay? So summary. You got my theory of transformation, right? Form teams, build backlogs, produce work and test software. Anything that gets in the way is an impediment that has to be broken. If you guys are gonna leave dependencies in place, you have to manage them. You cannot pretend they're gonna self-organize away. I think this is an excellent opportunity to go back to your executives and sponsors and say, this is what's getting in our way. We need, we need to get out in front of fixing these things because it's driving the teams crazy, right? And then kind of these corollaries and stuff like that, right? So we've just all recently gone through that. So what questions do you guys have for me? Yeah. 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 Interesting, right? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so yeah, no, I figured. I, whenever I come to DC, I just assume everybody in the room is government contractors doing work for folks, right? So, so here's here's the interesting thing. So, whenever I work with any kind of municipality and we have this conversation, the first thing that I ask is, I go, how how specific are the actual requirements? Okay, and, and so again, I know this is a broad generalization, but what I would suggest, if you think about like Leffingwell's epic feature user story kind of decomposition, I would suggest that the epics are pretty well defined. I would suggest that the features are probably well defined, but there's probably some room for negotiation down at the user story level. Maybe not always, but I would suggest in a lot of them it's like that, okay? And so I have this idea, like what, again, like five, six years ago, I started doing talks on agile program and portfolio management. And one of the things I would talk about often is that if you guys as a government contractor have sold, in effect, a fixed time, fixed cost, fixed scope delivery to somebody, okay, it is in your economic best interest to manage that or you won't be profitable. Fair? Okay? So what would you do, right? Those are no longer estimates. At the point that you've sold the deal and committed to it, those things are no longer estimates, they're constraints. So now what we have to try to do is we have to figure out how to optimize our economic outcomes in the presence of constraints. So what that means is that when you create that team, right, that middle tier team that I've been talking about where you get collaborative requirements decomposition, what that team does is it looks up at your epic commitments and your feature commitments and it says, okay, what user stories can I build that optimize my chances of delivering the epics on time and getting all the functionality in? And the reason why the notion of minimally marketable feature is so important is because at every step of the way, if I want to optimize my chances of delivering that contract on time, I better be delivering the smallest thing that could possibly satisfy that contract requirement every single step of the way, right? Okay, so what we do is we put that team in place and they're, they're, they're looking up and decomposing down, making trade-offs at this level to optimize chances of success at this level. The challenge is, is that if you just give it to the teams and say, just go do Scrum, right, without that intentional constant backlog grooming, then you don't win, right? One of the, one of the hardest dates, one of the, kind of the hardest things, this wasn't a government contract thing, but I had eight people sitting in a room for about four months, and like, it was literally like I got on the ground and it was like, go. We put together the roadmap, we put together the epic plan, the feature plan, and then started aggressively uh, delivering the backlog as fast as we could because we had to keep the scrum teams busy and we had to we had to get through the rest of the project. And I remember the product owner coming to me one time. She's like, Mike, I, this is as minimally marketable as it gets. I've taken out as much muscle. We're down to the bone. I can't go any deeper, right? And they ended up like you know going into the hardening period like two weeks or something like that. You know, so so aggressively, aggressively, aggressively make it as thin and minimally marketable as you can. And then at the point that you hit the wall, then you might have to go over the contract you know, performance or whatever. But there's, there's tactics for doing it. I believe when you're willing to look at Agile as like a lower left quadrant kind of thing. If you're stuck in the upper right quadrant, this is what Agile is, this is the only way to do it, then I don't think you win, I don't think you win when your customers are like that. 
Yes, sir. So, um, from what you told me, it looks like uh, these things uh, sink or swim with uh, good managers. If, 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 you, <coughs> if you don't have good managers who anticipate dependence, how many dependencies are well known even in yeah. large teams? Yeah. So, you wait till the last minute when you need somebody else's product. Yeah. So, so that's a really loaded way you just said that, right? You know you're in a room full of Agilists talking about managers. We don't have that oh, managers in Agile, oh, right? Yeah, tease him with you, man. Just tease him with you. Tease him. Right? Yeah, so, so where do managers go, right? So I don't think it's just managers deciding. The, when I talk about the requirements decomposition process, I talk generally about four points of view. There's a product point of view, an architect point of view, a product management or project management point of view, and like an analyst point of view. And what I want to do is I want to get a collaborative team in play and I want them to collaboratively decompose the backlog down and out, okay? Sometimes it makes a lot of sense for the managers to be in that room doing that work because quite often the managers kind of are the architects, right? They are the people that understand the product. They are the ones that are making those decisions. The trade-off we make with managers in Agile is that we want uh, managers to manage the context to manage the inputs, to manage the outputs, but we want to empower the team within the cell of the scrum team, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so I tend to unpack that word manager a little bit in this context, but managers often can play those roles. Any other questions? Thoughts? Does this feel plausible? Oh, yes, sir. Okay, so again, right, if you really get it, so let's just do one quick recap. So why does Agile fail? Right? We're in effect applying a practice or a methodology or a mindset into an environment that's not ready for it. Okay? And it's going to fail every single time. So what do you do about it? Right? What you do is that you focus on creating the right context for those practices and cultural um, <coughs> desires to thrive. But very often that's not a flip the switch because these are deep meaningful changes that you need to make. So be very pragmatic with your Agile, right? A, you know, a shoot for forming really clean encapsulated teams, getting really good backlogs, being able to produce a work and tested increment. But be real with where you are given your constraints. Make trade-offs in the short run. But here's the thing. When I say that, sometimes people will go, but Mike, if we take shortcuts now, we're never going to get where we need to be. Right? So that's why I say put together the in-state vision. Right, Get really clear on where you're at now, where you want to be, lay out a roadmap in your transformation about how you're going to get there, and then start communicating to the business as you make these changes, the kinds of economic improvements that are happening. And then ideally what you do is you create pull for future changes. Right? Okay, so just be really pragmatic about this stuff because there's nothing in Agile that's like a, really, it's like a silver bullet. Right? I mean, this stuff has to be managed. And, and I think some of us have drank the Kool-Aid and we're not managing stuff that we know needs to be managed in the name of Agile. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, I couldn't agree more about the backlog and the team. Yeah. A lot of the time, the whole dedicated team Super hard, yeah. The part that there's always a team that you cannot get away from. Yeah. Um, how do you convince at the executive level yeah. that yeah. Well, so so here's the thing: is that there will be environments where we get. Is there a question or you're? No, no. It's just waiting on the discovery. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought you were trying to get my attention. Okay. So so here's the thing, right? So not every team's going to have a tech writer. Not every team's going to have a DBA. Not every team's going to have a subject matter expert all the time. So what tends to happen is that down at the lower levels, you organize scrum teams. Okay. And then a lot of times, what you'll do is you'll take those subject matter experts and you'll level them up and make them a force multiplier and they'll be like an advisor to the teams or they'll be like in that requirements decomposition kind of feature or that group that I've been talking about. One of the things I didn't get really explicit about is in that middle program tier, we like to run a really explicit Kanban. And so sometimes when I'm doing a talk on that, I'll, I'll put like analysis design, build, test, deploy. And so what you might find is that like that product owner team is doing the analysis and design, all the decomposition and dependency management up front to build the backlog. Then when it gets to build, those backlog items are down getting built at the teams. And then let's say you had a performance and scalability lab. Right? Those performance and scalability people aren't going to be down at the team level. They might be up here in the program layer as like a step in the Kanban, and then deployment and release management could be after that. 
Okay, so as long as there's small batches running through and we're managing it in kind of a lean thing, paying attention to work in process and you know, making sure that we're subordinating the constraint, all that kind of a thing, then that kind of system can work. So a lot of times it's org design. Does somebody fit into a team or do they fit into this larger value stream? And even if you're managing like really explicitly in a larger value stream, you could still wrap it in a safe construct and, and do that, right? As long as you have the right levels of encapsulation. I don't know. I know that was like a lot of stuff for like a really like a two second action. Yeah, we can do like whiteboards after or something. Yeah. One more, one more question. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so I'm gonna answer that two ways. So I don't care about the product owner and the scrum master, but I care that the um, that the functions that those roles were formed to do are done. Okay? So if so the, the problem when you look at it the other way is you can have a product owner and not have a good backlog. You can have a scrum master all day long and not have a protected team, okay? So one of the challenges is that, and this is language that I really reject in Scrum, right? Teams don't need to be protected. They need to operate within a rational system, right? If they operated, if you think about it, if you had a team that operated in the way that I'm talking with a really clear backlog, able to produce a working tested increment, what would that team need to be protected from, right? The system around that team is broken and so, again, right, I understand that in a broken system, the scrum master might have to play that role. But what I would suggest is that long term, that won't solve the problem. Okay? The only long term solution for agile at scale in complex organizations is fix the system. Just is, right? And that feels inarguable to me because, I mean, that scrum master is just going to get burnt out, undervalued. They're going to go do something else, right? They're going to get tired of fighting against a system that is not going to fix itself. So the cool thing that we have in our favor right now is that it, this isn't 10 years ago, right? We're not explaining Agile to people, right? We're not like, this isn't like, oh, your waterfall, let's do Agile. Well, maybe it is in this town, but in most towns it's not that, right? But you know, but, but you guys, I'm sorry, I'm picking on you guys, but you get the idea, right? Most executives, at least in public companies, CIOs, CTOs, chief product owners, they, they get Agile. They want it. But the problem is, is that a lot of us are selling them snake oil, right? Just do these things and this magic will happen. And they know how broken their organizations are and they know this stuff won't work. And so they're dying for people to show up and be able to say, this is how you do it. This is how we're gonna justify the investment. This is what it's gonna look like. This is what your roadmap is. This is what's gonna happen. And they're smart people, right? And so we have a really unique opportunity as Agilists to go tell a bigger story and to make meaningful change, okay? And so we don't have to fight this groundswell, grassroots thing as much as we used to, right? There are executives out there that really get it. They just want something that's credible, right? None of this magic hand wavy stuff that we've been doing for the last 10 years. Okay, I think we're, I think we're wrapped. Thank you, Mike. Okay, awesome, guys. <laughs> Again? So we've been Facebook live streaming this in the back and it's like, you guys do that all the time. That's our first experiment with it. So I'm hoping that it actually like worked. So uh, anyway, <laughs> it so like it did. did it look like it did? Uh, awesome. Mike, as a token of our appreciation awesome. for coming out here and talking to us, we wanted to cool. get outside and go to yeah, REI. Yeah, REI, okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Stick around here for a second. Yeah, no, I'm sticking. I'm good. Uh, oh, no, 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 you're going to pick the, uh, the grandfather's oh, okay. Not yet, not yet. I, I want to see uh, LJ, if you can come on up. Uh, we've got our raffle tickets to draw and some really cool prizes to win. But before we get into that too, uh, like we always do, we like to continuously improve. So there's cards out to the front door. Green if you loved it. Yellow if it's, eh, could use some improvement. Red, uh, not coming back. Uh, but please leave a note as to why you don't want to come back because we might try to improve that. Um, it could be either the talk or the facility, the food, Whatever, I know there's an elevator issue uh, that will hopefully worth writing down so we remember. But uh, those are the kind of things we'd love to see on here because we do take note and try to improve. So that's out of the front door. All right, so we have, speaking of safe, we have a sign. Well, we'll get into that one afterwards. Whoa, sign. Um, the rollout by Alex Yakima. Yep. 
Uh, LJ from Agile Craft is going to draw the location. This is signed as well. Um, is it Fallon? Number 8429196. What are the last three numbers? 196. Oh, Ted. Uh, I saw her. Where is she? Next to Art. Yeah. Yep. Oh, sorry. I didn't that's it. What's your name? Phaeton. Phaeton. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Come on up. <laughs> that's here for Phaeton. Like <laughs> and we also have not one, well, one each, but a uh, $25 gift card from uh, this place called Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> 